work at Cambridge and then got his PhD at CFA at Harvard. Then he went on to do a postdoc at Fermilab and uh, was a Hubble Fellow at Princeton and then joined the faculty at Columbia and there ever since. And uh, today he's going to talk about the origin and detection of high resolution supermassive black holes. Thank you. It's uh, very nice to be here. I'm actually feeling more lovely because I probably when I used to come I knew my visa every year when I was in Portugal. So I'm going to be very convenient since I came several times. So these are not visa friendly, it's my green card. I have no boss looking to come. So anyway, it's nice to be here. Uh, the work I will tell you about is done by mostly by junior students of mine. And basically, this puzzle, which I think you probably all have heard, we have discovered billions of unknown black holes which are present in the universe. Well, the universe is very young, about a billion years old. And so how these black holes came about? This is the subject of this talk. And it will be a strange talk. I just want to warn you that I think there's no solution without some major design. So I'm going to tell you two possibilities how these black holes form, both of which have major problems. And uh, hopefully, observationally, we can clarify this. So, uh, since not everybody is familiar uh, with the topic, I do want to give a little introduction. This is the number of slides. So, I want to talk a little bit about the observations themselves, and then parts of the theory, which are sort of solid, uh, the background, how you might form the first stars which leave behind C black holes, which can go into B black holes. And then we have two methods to form them to, to grow these black holes into billion solar masses. One is to start from solar mass holes and build them up by eight orders of magnitude over time. And the other one is to get a big head start and form a million solar mass black holes much faster and then only grow three orders of magnitude. And this is the number of slides. So this should, I guess, give you a hint that I think maybe this is more possible. Spend a bit more time on this. This possibility. Then I hope I have time, at least in these slides, to at least raise the possibility now in the future we actually zoom in on the first point. So the observations are basically which were taken over the last 10 years. Uh, we started with a small survey and they have found very bright quasars around the two six. So these are, to be emphasized from the beginning, these are very rare, so five signal objects. Uh, so we're trying to explain not some mean <coughs> property of the universe, but rather some uh, uh, rare phenomenon. So uh, about 10 of these were found in Sloan, and now there are about 20 in the Canada French survey, uh, and then a few others by other methods, in radio, for example. So there's maybe three dozen of these quasars beyond the issue six. Uh, the record holder was actually just announced in July, that she said it was one. The age of the universe then is 0.8 kilometers. Uh, this object was actually found in Euclid's uh, in infrared survey. Now, these objects, as I mentioned, they're tip of the iceberg. Their space density is very low, it's one of these per cubic gigaparsec. This is the luminosity function, it's very steep. Uh, uh, Consistent in the idea that they're in a very rare, bright, and pale, some of not function, rare objects. Now, the masses of these quasars, the masses of the black holes, the power powering these quasars, they're obviously very bright quasars. Uh, it doesn't even sound detect them, so they're in a shallow survey. Uh, the masses can be estimated most simply by assuming that the shine is at income luminosity. So you simply take the income luminosity, which is uh, perimeter mass. Being able to portion of the mass, and uh, you divide the observable mass, it can be defined that these are several billion solar mass objects. This is actually consistent with the measured post stable masses for these objects, which you can just simply guess from the space density of the quasars. You ask what kind of halo has the space density of ratio 6, dark matter halo, they're residing several times 10 to the 12 solar mass halos. So this is a basic picture. These are very, very massive halos. This thing early on, it's 
some very rare massive black holes. And so just to outline here the basic problem, this is if you say what is the most naive model I can make to form such a black hole, it's well, I have some stellar mass black hole, let's say 10 solar masses, which form very early in the universe at which is 35. And then it's growing at a rate, uh, a mass fusion rate, which is limited by the energy and luminosity, so it's growing exponentially over the entire history of the universe. Uh, then we have to involve radiative efficiency to get the atoms on time scale, so I just put here 10%. And I collected here the data from these three papers. I simply computed the black hole masses of the objects based on the atoms on luminosity, assuming they are the atoms on luminosity. These blue are the strong quasars. They cluster at slightly higher masses than this slightly deeper survey under the French Hawaii uh, higher shift weather search several times 10 to 8 or 10 to 9 solar masses. This is the new record of the quasar. And this red curve is this exponential growth. So I started at Redshift 35 here, growing exponentially. So you can reach these masses. Obviously, this is very active. And this, this object is actually 10 times larger than it could be, even if it's so this uninterrupted heading from growth. And so, uh, well, the conclusion from this plot is that we have several new objects pushing on this possibility. And, uh, well, obviously it's good to start to grow this whole very early. And the efficient rate cannot hold much below any kind of significant duration of periods, otherwise this will not work. Now the obvious alternatives, which are with the rest of the talk, is you have to either grow much faster than the any kind of or maybe you can try to merge many, many black holes together. The last slide I want to say about the observations, just because if you're a skeptic, you could ask, well, maybe we're a fool. Actually, there aren't any supermassive black holes in the universe. Somehow the observations are missing. So I want to just say that this is probably the problem in the history of the state. Uh, because the obvious things you could imagine uh, screw, screw up this interpretation is lensing. You could say, well, these are bright quasars, but actually they're faint intrinsically. They were just magnified by a factor of 100. Uh, and we think they're much brighter than they actually are. This possibility can be ruled out, because if this was the case, you would see two images uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, because in large magnification always comes with a second detectable image. We can actually show this. Um, and the quasars were looked at with Hubble, and this was not seen. No, no way they can be done. Uh, you can ask about beaming, but maybe they're actually, in this Eddington argument, you assume the same source, which is isotropic geometric. But what if they were beamed toward us into an angle, let's say, 100 of the solid angle? Then again, this could be uh, emitting a much smaller velocity. Small black hole, just aiming toward us, is also not possible, because these squares, as it turns out, have very normal ratios of emission lines to the continuum. If they were being in a narrow angle toward us, it would only power emission lines uh, in the, that fraction of the solid angle compared to the continuum. They would be producing the combination of the emission lines from the rest of the sphere. And so they should have very weak lines, which is not the case. So they're not being not then furthermore the Actually, an Eddington ratio can actually be empirically measured. So this is a relatively new technique. Maybe I won't go into the details. At low redshift, it's a technique called reverberation mapping, which can be used to measure black hole masses. And it turns out you can use that to calibrate uh, the measurement of the black hole mass based on carbon and magnesium minus. So this has been done empirically calibrated at low redshift. Then you observe the time with for the higher shift quasars and you infer the black hole mass. And this shows here the Eddington ratios. These are lower redshift quasars, these red are the high redshift quasars in the CFH2S survey. And this is the luminosity, this is black hole mass, this is the Eddington ratio of one. So they're basically consistent with the F shining at the Eddington lumen. Whereas the redshift three quasars shine at sort of 10% of the Eddington. The last point I like to make always is even if somehow one of these arguments are wrong, 
even then we would have a problem because these, these luminosities are so large that suppose actually the black hole is only a minute solar mass is. It's emitting such a large luminosity that it's anyway going to grow to a billion solar masses in this evolving time, it's 40 million years. If this is the evolving time, uh, uh, for doubling the mass, and based on the observed luminosities, the mass accretion rate to sustain the luminosity is so high that we have 14 million years, they would anyway grow to a few billion solar masses. Even if they were right now low mass black holes, they're accreting so fast that we would have to explain how to stop. Within 40 million years, we would end up with a billion solar mass black hole. Okay, that's the explain why right? it's accreting so much about the energy point of view. So uh, there are many of the points of Indian gravitation and I think yes, uh, that we should see a lot of them. I'm just saying, if you see a point source, a point source, it was magnified by an intervening lens, uh, such as our implication is large, you will actually see the images yeah. separated by a fraction of an R second. And we don't see that. And we don't see that. Okay. So, so now we have this problem, how do the billion solar mass black holes form by redshift of six? So there's these two basic pictures I already mentioned. So one is that we have a hot 10 or maybe 100 solar mass black hole left behind by the first star in the universe, which is growing uh, continuously at a rate which is somehow comparable to the mass equation that will sustain the electron velocity. Now, this involves basically that this black hole has to always sit in dense gas, continuously supply with gas, with no interruption. It has to avoid uh, radiated feedback uh, generated by the black hole itself from suppressing this mass accretion rate. And it must also avoid basically getting ejected from the halos, which I will mention later on. When two black holes merge, they can receive a recoil and then eject. Now the other idea is that we form a million solar mass black hole much faster. Uh, you know, I'll explain where that might happen. But the idea is that this happens by rapid collapse of gas to the center of some halo, either directly into a black hole or first going to either a supermassive star, which then is unstable and at the end of its life makes a black hole, so-called quasi-star, which I don't think I'll explain in detail, or maybe just form a extremely dense star cluster, which only goes for collapse and makes a super black hole. The trick here for this scenario is you have to have very fast accretion of gas on larger scales in the center of the early galaxy. And you have to get rid of your angular momentum and you have to make sure the gas doesn't fragment into low mass species before it reaches the center. These are the challenges. Now the good thing is we have cosmology theory. And we can actually do some of this very vigorously. This is the power spectrum. I like to show this. Let's to show you that this is uh, on this in some ways. This is the primordial fluctuations in the universe at high redshift. This is the power spectrum brought by microwave background and large scale structures. And we can evolve this power spectrum forward. Uh, Ten years ago, I had to apologize for doing so called flash vector and doing this semi analytically. Now we have n-body simulations, which resolve at redshift 30 down to uh, very small halos, millions of mass halos or so. So we know exactly when you move this forward and you just address gravitational instability, how many halos you form at redshift. So we have the halo mass function. The only real caveat which could really hurt us is if the power spectrum. So we are actually, the only caveat here is we extrapolate the power spectrum to about a hundred times smaller scale than is actually appropriate in this cosmological data set. The first objects forming a million solar masses, they're sort of here on this ball. Okay. So if the power spectrum first to turn down or up, it could be extrapolated, that would change the picture. Otherwise, the halo mass is quite solid. Uh, for example, just to and this is when one dark matter models, which are sometimes popular for other reasons nowadays, can truncate this power spectrum to become very difficult. 
before anything that lets you 15 or 20 million would be hard to make new black holes. Uh, okay, so then the question is what happens in this halo? Uh, at which forms first in the universe that lets you 20? And this is one of the early 3D simulations in Heidel, which shows what happens. And the cool, the, the key here is the cooling of the gas. So this shows here the density structure of uh, a million solar mass cable collapsing in the shape of the This is from this paper by Yoshida. And you may see this is a very high resolution simulation. And what, they, what happens here is that molecular cooling by hydrogen molecules allows the cooling and contraction of gas to the center of the halo uh, here. And uh, it forms a protostar, which is very small, 0.01 solar masses. But the conclusion from actually a large number of such simulations was that a 100 solar mass star, a single 100 solar mass star, forms at the center of the halo. Now, this will be important to understand where this number 100 solar masses comes from. So I want to show this from our I also like to make a joke here. This is, I think, should not be called a simulation, it should be called a calculation. Because simulation sometimes has a bad name implying that we subunit physics. And this problem in particular is actually so well defined that this is basically rigorous calculation of the physics. No free parameters in physics and no subunit physics. Uh, uh, so this is our own simulation, but again, the conclusion is very generic and done by Chen Shang. And so, what, the way you represent the result of this simulation is you have this spherical blob of gas falling into the halo, and you have spherical shells, and you ask how much mass is in each shell. Let's plot it here. And only the red curve is what I wanted to see. This is how long it takes for that shell to fall into the center. So this is basically the accretion rate or velocity as a function of radius. And you can see on this plot that there's an accretion rate which is about, this will be important later, so about point 10 minus 2 or 10 to the minus 3 solar mass per year. And so uh, the solar, the 100 solar mass comes from the fact that you ask, if you wait 100,000 years, which is the Kelvin Helmholtz time, that's how long it takes for a protostar basically to contract and become a and start nuclear reactions. So if you ask how much mass has fallen to the center in 100,000 years, uh, then you see on this curve that that's about 100 or 200 solar masses. So that's in inevitably incorporated in principle into the star, and now you have a 100 solar mass star, settling on the mean This is the origin. Now, this mass could actually be changed. Uh, and very recently, there's at least two other considerations people have been addressing. One is radiative self-regulation. Even in the, as the star is turning on, you start to generate radiation. And uh, the model for this analytically, for example, and more recently simulations, which show that this radiation in the protostellar, in the protostellar revolution phase uh, does various things, dissociate the molecules, so it's radiation pressure on the falling gas uh, uh, and makes an ionized region. That in this paper, they said it limits the mass of 140 solar masses. It's actually there is not a big change. It has basically not any change much. The simulation, which I heard recently, gets 43 solar masses. Uh, another very important development is people have started asking whether in these simulations, uh, for example, what you see here, do you really get a single star or do you get several stars in the center by segmentation? So, actually, I don't think I want to go into the details of this. There was a recent work which suggested, I write it off, they suggested that the gas might actually fragment into several pieces. I think it's an unsolved problem. Here we just care about. Uh, <coughs> If the gas were the fragment, what is the mass of the heaviest fragment? So we really just need one, for our purposes, one remnant C black hole. So we want one of these fragments to be the mass of the star to leave behind the C black hole if we want to use. So I think that's still quite possible even in the experimentation. In fact, the reason is 
before we increase our matches to the same time, it's perfect. Uh, of course, this is another famous plot. I'm sure half of you have seen this. This plot shows the end fates of stars as a function of the mass and metallicity. This is combined by uh, A here. And we are talking here about zero metallicity gas. This is the stellar mass. And this is the fate of the star. So above 40 solar masses, up to 140, you collapse directly into a black hole at the end of the lifetime of the star. So above 140, there's heavy instability supernovae. At zero 40, you still get black holes up down to about 25 solar masses. Uh, the remnant is still a black hole, but now the gas actually, the star actually drives the wind and ejects metals. Uh, and that's important. Uh, I will explain later why. Uh, but then the gas falls back in and get a black hole on this. It's, it's true that the heaviest part of this is most important to take format. It's true that it also depends on the number of fragments of that pattern. You know, there's no competition on this. You have competition with Christian if you have. So, right. It, it's true. So, if you got, I mean, this, there's no real IMS for part of this image. Right. But okay, so this is the picture from their paper. This is this. They're zinc particles. And these fragments have masses between 0.1 and 10 solar masses. It could be that none of these know about 10 solar masses at the end. But we just don't know. It's an awful problem. Okay, so the good news is that we think we get black holes from this first star after they die. And we might even get black holes with no without corresponding metal production. Metals are basically bad, I can give away a point here, it's because they allow more cooling and more fragmentation. So if you want to uh, the most optimistic scenario is that the, the gas remains metal free. It's difficult that to fragment. And we might get those situations where you have 40 solar mass stars. Uh, and above. Okay. So now comes the first idea. Oops. Forming the black holes using the, the stellar seeds. And so again here the idea is pretty simple. Uh, we have the merger three of dark matter and yellows and we have the seed black holes at high redshift populating the early halos. And let's say we allow these black hole seeds to grow exponentially over time, and we also allow them to merge. We can ask how much, what do we end up with by redshift for seeds? A very large number of papers, actually, that do this kind of exercise uh, at various levels of complexity, including uh, also high level simulations, which extend to high redshift. Uh, but this is basically the picture. So the merger tree that you generate should end at redshift 6. You should end up with a billion star mass black hole. The whole scale has several standard as well solar masses. And you want to go down to some high redshift, let's say the usual redshift of 30, to resolve the first scale. And so the approach I want to take here is to be as simple as possible. And so the three, so basically this, this is from this paper by Dr. Tanaka where we generated these merger trees. We had halos at virtue 6 in this range. We had uh, about 100,000 merger trees, and we went down to mm -hmm. two times down to five solar masses in the branches of these halos. And I just wanted to focus on the three obvious important assumptions you have to make. First is, what fraction of these mini halos that form at virtue you know, 25, what fraction of them will actually have a stellar mass C black hole. Now that's the C fraction will depend on the IMS, which was the question we already alluded to. Uh, could be that the IMS doesn't extend to 25 solar masses, then we have zero, or all the mass, all the stars are massive, then this would be one. But that's just the IMS. There's also the feedback. It could be uh, that many of these mini halos cannot actually cool and for any stars because of the lining burning radiation uh, in the soft ultraviolet 
bands, you should destroy the molecular hydrogen. So it could be that only in a small fraction of this early population of new halos won't any, any star at all. So here I'm just going to treat this as a free parameter. And you can vary it from one as the most optimistic down to some small numbers. Okay, so this basically, pictorially, if you go on to your merger tree, the white is obviously representing here the dark matter halos. You have to decide what fraction of them to populate with seed, seed stars. And I say that's not three parameter. Now the second three parameter is how fast these seeds will grow. So the obvious, well, so the, this is, this you could think of the duty cycle, if they have a behavior which is intermittent. The seeds could grow and then not grow, grow, not grow, episodically. Then this would be a duty cycle, representing the time average attrition trade. Or it could be that they grow all the time in a monotonic fashion, but at some rate which is, uh, which is uh, smaller than the any So this, this duty cycle, F duty, is another thing for under. When it's one, that would represent growth at the Eddington rate at all, at all times. If it's 10%, it would represent either 10% Eddington rate at all times, or it would represent Eddington 10% of the time, zero or 90 percent Now, it should also be emphasized that, in principle, uh, the maximum rate, in order to produce a mass accretion rate, which, which is at the Eddington rate, you also have to have dense, dense ambient gas because you're also limited by the bond rate. This is the rate at which a point mass will grow inserted in a homogeneous gas. So if this, if this rate is smaller than the Eddington rate, you should use this. So it's another limitation. And I won't, well, uh, and then for, because of this, it matters a lot what you assume is this ambient density surrounding your stellar mass C. Uh, and, well, again, simple approaches, you look at these simulations, they have this profile, that H2 cooling cools the gas, and the gas settles into this R2 minus 2.2 profile. It's an empirical result from the hydro simulations. But it can get quite dense in the center. Uh, if it couldn't cool, then you would have a hydrostatic equilibrium in your dark matter halo, and you would not have a core. You would, have, you would not have this cost. You would have a core at the center due to the uh, uh, gas being on the area back turning by the front motion. And I'm just going to ignore this from the start because if you do this, the density is so low that you will get basically no significant growth at all. I just want to press the point that you have to assume that the black hole seed is always sitting in this very dense core of these halos, which is already getting very optimistic. Otherwise, you cannot go just to go to the bottom. And then the last obvious assumption, so just again, going back to the picture, this assumption tells you how fast these black holes are growing in each branch. The last obvious assumption you have to make is what happens when two galaxies with their black holes they merge together. Now, again, here, obviously, the assumption that's most optimistic is you simply merge the two black holes. Now you have a bigger black hole, and it's continuing to grow uninterrupted at its new higher end Again, very optimistic. Uh, in reality, and well, and then this assumes that the galaxies merge, which holds this to the tiny mini galaxies will merge, presumably due to dynamical friction, like in larger mergers. And then uh, the black holes will call essence either. Well, there's no stop stellar component here, which will be scattered like in large galaxies. So you have to say that there's enough gas there colliding on track to bring the black holes together. Uh, even if you assume this, that the black holes have grown together, there's a very dangerous event, which is the gravitational recoil. So this is something you, again, probably you, most of you have seen in the last few years in numerical GR. The merger problem was solved. They merged two black holes, fully solving the metric evolution uh, of, the merging, the, of the merging black hole pair. And because of momentum conservation, the merged black hole recoils at speeds of 
distributed to several hundred kilometers per second. This recoil speed depends on the orbital parameters of the merging black holes. And the most important thing is that they are typically hundreds of kilometers per second, whereas the escape velocity from a redshift 30, so if you look at here, one of these host halos, a redshift 30, a million solar mass halo, the escape velocity is more than one kilometer per second. So if this was the escape velocity from one kilometer per second, also from here, one kilometer per second, and then emerge, and this is kicked by 100 kilometers per second, that's really a potentially a problem if you go back home. Uh, now, this kick depends a lot on spins, whether the spins are aligned. If the spins are aligned, the problem is you know, more symmetric and we get smaller kicks. Also, if one black hole is much smaller than the other, we get smaller kicks. That's important. But here I'm just going to assume either random or aligned things when I come back to this data. I have ignored this for the detail of the principle, even if you keep above the escape velocity, you can use the gas drag to settle back after some time. So we put that in the model, it doesn't turn out really well. Okay, so these are the results. And I apologize, but I have to show up. Because I have these three basic things, I want to show you how the results are affected by turning these three knobs. This is still, I think, not so bad. This is a single model captures the three most important things. So what I'm showing here is the mass function. So we run these models. We have these three parameters. And then we the collection six ask how many black holes we've made uh, of each mass. So these are black hole mass functions. Uh, 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 11 or even 12 solar masses. Uh, this is the black hole mass and this is the space density in the units of cubic in the parsec. And this red curve is where we want to be into the observations. We want to produce enough black holes to enter over here. So what you can see immediately, and then this is reducing the CD fraction. And this is uh, changing the alignment of the spins from random to aligned. And then this is reducing the release cycle. So here's one thing you can notice. As you decrease the seed infraction, uh, if you reduce it below about 10 minus 3, even if everything else is most optimistic, you, you just barely make this black hole. So conclusion one is at least 0.1% of these halos should have a stellar mass seed black hole. Uh, are there uh, constraints on that seed from the progenitors of the black holes not being added in the universe? Well, I will come back to this. So, uh, 10 minus 3 is pretty small, so maybe that's okay. You probably don't find that in the universe. You just have a small number of black holes. But I actually come back to this. Uh, Okay, so we need to populate at least 0.1% of the halos with seeds. Now, if you look at what happens as you change the spins from random to line, and you reduce the kicks, if you look at something interesting, it, it makes a big difference uh, in this model, where all the halos have a seed. Uh, this one, uh, there are many more black holes. If the spins are aligned and the kicks are smaller. In this case, when the seed fraction is small, it actually makes no difference. The peaks make no difference. I will also explain this in a second. So, so this would be my favorite model. Uh, in, a, in a moment, I will explain why. So you can see that in this model, the peaks actually don't hurt you. And then finally, the duty cycle. This is almost trivial conclusion. As you reduce the duty cycle, you just reduce the black hole masses. So you shift everything to the left. And you're going to see if you go below 0.6, none of these models, that's the green curve, none of them anymore produce enough black holes. So that's just the same conclusion that at least half the time or more, all the black holes, even after the merger models are taken into account, the several of them can merge together. Even then, uh, at least half the time or more, they have to be shooting at the other rate. So now, uh, so but in principle, you see that you can get up to this observation of units if you make this very optimistic assumption. But now I have to show you something which is 
very problematic. If you look at the slope of these mass functions, it's actually not quite ridiculous. Uh, this is actually 10 orders of magnitude here in space and This is an extremely steep mass function. So when you match the number, the observed number density of billions of mass by poles, you produce enormous number of millions of mass by poles in these models. And that's just because basically where everything everything is allowed to grow, we're making these optimistic assumptions. And the Halo mass function is very steep. It's actually just two. At redshift six, there is something like a billion times more kind of the 10 solar mass halo than kind of the cross solar mass halo. It's a very steep mass function. What was the spin magnitude? So the magnitudes were chosen to be uh, point, randomly between point 0.9 and 1, relatively high spin. It all doesn't matter, I understand why. So, this is a big problem. Basically, if, if you now ask, I ask well, how much black hole mass is produced in these models, in million solar mass black holes, uh, that I can compare to the observed space density at redshift zero. Uh, and at redshift zero, you know that there's about half a million solar mass in black holes in the electric nuclei per cubic megaparsec. We also know that at most 10% of this mass density existed beyond redshift 6. This is from famous Sultan argument, which I won't explain unless you ask me. But we actually know that at most maybe 10% of this mass was present. Most of this was grown in the last around redshift 3, where the plate flows are a few peaks. So at redshift of 6, maybe we have at most 4 times 7 to 4 solar mass per cubic megaparsec. And then if you just integrate this mass function that I just showed, typically they are hundreds of thousands times larger than this limit. So they are clearly overproduced by a large factor. So to solve this problem, I, I want to show this plot. And this plot shows where these black holes actually come from. So this is a model where the seed fraction is low, 10 minus 3. Uh, and the <coughs> The other two parameters are not very important. The seed fractions are, are small, and this shows the redshift distribution of the mass that may finally be black hole. These are the, this is the problem for the, the redshift distribution of the seed black holes uh, by their contribution to the final billion solar mass for the dead curve. That's the billion solar mass black holes. Then the intermediate mass black holes, 10 to the 7 and 9. These are the 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7 solar mass black holes. Okay. How much of the mass of the black hole came from seeds that were redshift? So what this shows you is that basically most of these billion solar masses in the black holes we made successfully, they came from seeds which arose around redshift from almost 30. So these are the very rare first emails where the seeds were placed. The million solar black holes in this model came mostly from seeds simply that form later, but should 15 or so. So they just have less time to grow and they were of course also in larger fields. This separation is actually not so clear if the occupation fraction is one. And uh, this is actually suggests that this may be the best hope to solve this overproduction problem because suppose now some process for which we have some physical candidates stops forming more seed black holes below redshift 20 or so. Then you can completely eliminate this overprediction. This, this just suggests a single solution. You have, as I described, seed black holes forming due to stars in these very early halos. But then, for some reason beyond redshift 20, we don't anymore have these seeds. This could be because of what we just said, the universe is ionized. So by redshift 20 or 15, the mini halos just don't form stars. Or they are polluted by metals, and the mass function of the stars becomes normal saltpeter, and you just don't get any more seeds, except with very massive stars. And then we solve this solar prediction problem. You can't actually do that in this model, because uh, the simple redshift cost just doesn't work here. And so the reason for this, so the last point, just to explain in one more sentence how this works. So what happened in this model is that there were no ejections. The 
a few halos that measure 25, which have a seed, they started growing in mass. Uh, we are allowing them to grow at the Eddington Bay. And by the time they first merge with another halo, they are already grown a factor of 100 in mass. So now you have a 10 to the 4. Let's say our seed here was a with solar mass. So it's already 10 to the 4 solar masses when it has its first merger with another halo, which has a 100 solar mass. So now we have a merger between a 10 to the 4 and a 100 solar mass black hole. And the kicks actually then are very small. This here shows uh, the, the probability distribution of kick velocities, and this is basically a fit to the numerical GR results as a function of the mass ratio. And this is the aligned, and this is the random spins. Actually, here's the answer to your question. The spins were between 0 and 0.9. And so you see, this is what I said earlier, that if the spins are random, it's a few hundred kilometers per second for an equal mass black hole. But the kicks actually go down to about 1 kilometers per second, irrespective of the spins, if the mass ratio is less than 1%. So this is basically, I think, the potential solution to this. The form of very few seeds very early, they start growing in mass, and the merger of them very unequal, so the kicks don't hurt them anymore, so they grow even more. And we think of this as a runaway process, that they just grow more and more heavy compared to the other black hole that comes in, but they never kick down. This is why the kicks don't make any difference in this model, where the seed fraction is high, uh, is, is there, uh, and this is why it might also work to the this overproduction. It doesn't work in the model where the seeds are very common because they always merge when they're nearly equal masses and they keep getting kicked down. So I guess that's it for the so I think I will end this and move on to the other model. I would just say in summary that this is possible. If you, and I think this is probably the killer assumption, I'm still assuming that all the time the black holes sit in a dense region and are not suppressed much below the other I think that is actually the worst assumption. Otherwise, if you make the seed rare, they have a high duty cycle, you can basically do this. You just also need this feedback to eliminate the overproduction of the lower mass black holes. Now I think I have a few minutes for the other. Um, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so let's move on and discuss the other alternative, which is direct collapse of gas faster than the other one. So, just for reference, you should remember this, uh, the Eddington rate about 10 to the minus 2 solar mass per year for a 2 times 7 to the 5 solar mass black hole. Now, we actually, I already argued that you need to accrete in the Kelvin Helmholtz time uh, some mass M and that gives you the mass of the star or whatever form in the center of the halo. But if you want to form rapidly a 10 to the 5 solar mass halo, and this is what I ask you to remember, 10 minus 2 solar mass per year was the accretion rate in the meaning of cooling by molecular hydrogen. If you want to actually assemble 10 to the 5 solar mass object, you need to increase this rate by a factor of 100 or 1,000. So that's not going to happen in the meaning of uh, And a problem I just won't talk about, but you should be at least made aware, is again, radiative feedback in principle. And press the mass from actually reaching the black hole at the center of the hill. So, uh, so it's okay if, if we produce a situation, which is basically what I will do in the next 10 slides, where we get this high accretion rate, the problem is still unsolved because uh, you, you in principle can make winds given out the radiation pressure uh, as opposed to actually swallowing all this mass to the center of and this is again unsolved. So this is what we have to keep in mind. We need to have rapid gas fall of our solar mass per year. We have to get rid of angular momentum. I think I won't really dwell on this, but you need either some kind of large viscosity or you need to focus on special regions with lower angular momentum. You have to avoid fragmentation, which generally means you should not cool down to low temperatures and you, not, you should not have a 
metals or hydrogen molecules. Otherwise, you cool down to 200 Kelvin. Uh, maybe I'll also skip this. I think this well. Getting rid of any momentum and avoiding the fragmentation is actually the same problem that we have for beta fueling, if you work on that topic. Uh, where the problem is how you fuel right radars, large amounts of gas to the center without fragmenting. Okay. That's actually similar to what we have here. And the key is you should be stable locally, you should not fragment the gas. But you should have global instability that bars which drives the gas to the center. Uh, so there is a promising site where this might happen, which are so-called atomic cooling halos. So these halos, which have minimal temperatures above 10,000 Kelvin, uh, in principle, they cool uh, uh, by atomic cooling, even if they're all hydrogen molecules, and they remain isothermal. The gas in a halo, which has real temperatures above 104, shock heats the gas 104, or confessionally heats 104, and the gas remains at 104, and can keep continue collapsing, and then the fusion rate, mass fusion rate, will actually be pretty much automatically about solar mass in here. In fact, we do this in simulations, but again, it is, in principle, very simple. The fusion rate of a self gravitating gas goes like the sound speed to the cube. And when you have mini halos which cool by molecular hydrogen, the sound speed is cubed in order per second. If the gas remains at 10,000 degrees, this is 10 kilometers per second, so you raise the fusion rate. Uh, of, of this and the center. Now, furthermore, we showed actually a, a while ago <coughs> that if you make a standard mole, so a mole, mole, white disc, so the picture here would be that there are dark matter halo. The gas is just sitting at 10,000 degrees, cannot move below that, because we are saying there are no molecules. Then you have uh, the same usual setup of a galactic disc, except it's scaled down to a, you know, a and the mass halo. You can show that this disk is actually stable. The Q parameter in the center is a tumor Q parameter. Or you can just say the G mass initially with this object is standard line and this is solar mass. It is very promising. You have a halo, the gas comes in very fast. You could actually collect them the five solar masses within 10 or five years to make the hole. Moreover, it probably won't fragment. It's metal free and it stays at the temperature because this will form will be stable. Then we're going to simulations early on. A few of these which actually did not see fragmentation. So sort of confirm that. <coughs> there are a bunch of papers which are again one summarized, which propose that in this situation you can collapse directly onto a black hole or if you have a sea black hole, you can collapse very rapidly. Uh, trapping the radiation. Okay. This is so super elegant and the gun is so often to take the traps the radiation from the direction to the black hole or more in fragment into a dense cluster of stars. But all this relies on basically this large equation rate and not fragment before you reach very high densities. In this case possible that at the very end you fragment into stars. Okay now I think I just want to address the key assumption here, which is if the gas was to cool below 10 to the 4, the molecules would form, uh, then it would be hot because it would be basically exactly like in a mini halo. The accretion rate would again slow down, the sound speed would be very low, and you would make the massive stars that you use in the mini halo. So this is really a crucial assumption, and that's what we addressed uh, recently. So, I just want to explain what you have to do to prevent molecular hydrogen from cooling down this gas and keeping this in Does that make sense? So this is the main assumption. Now, molecular formation rate is a two-body process. It goes like density squared. And you generally want to equate that. So one way to do this is photodissociate in the molecules with a U ultraviolet radiation shining on this halo, which is trying to form the black hole. The photodissociation rate will go like density times the flux. So if you equate these two, you will find that there will be some critical flux, which is linearly proportional to the density. 
which balances the formation of major molecules and therefore if it suppresses molecules from forming. Now the question is what density should you use when you calculate this field of loss? In the mini halos, if there's no high molecules, as I mentioned earlier, you would have an hydrostatic equilibrium. The gas could not cool. There's no mechanism to cool the gas in the mini halo. <coughs> if you wipe out the molecules, and you can estimate the central density in these halos, it's about 0.1 to 1 cubic centimeter. And you can calculate this flux, it's about 0.01 to 0.1. In units, if hopefully you're familiar with the units of J.1. For reference, this unit is such that the ratio is 3, the background radiation in the universe is about 1. Or another way to compare this is uh, it's about, it has to be about 10 at the ionization. If you put 10 mV per hydrogen atom in the universe, at which 10, this background J21 will be about 10. That's the natural level of the background just before ionization. So this is very low. So that's, that's good in the sense that maybe we can kill the molecules. In, but this doesn't work in these bigger halos because they cool by atomic cooling. And they reach, so in principle, even if you have such a background, and you have mini halos, you keep them from forming stars because you wiped out the molecules, they merge into the bigger halos. The bigger halo reaches this critical threshold where it can cool by atomic cooling, and the gas just keeps getting denser and denser because it has no pressure support. Atomic cooling is effective. Does that make sense? So then the density will increase and eventually you will form molecules. So here, actually, the density that's relevant is the critical density. This is purely determined by properties of H2. There is a critical density of H2 of about 10 to the 4 cubic centimeter, at which provisionally you maintain, uh, or at which the populations of the rotation and vibrational levels of H2, which goes the H2 cooling, reach LTE at this density. And the, at this point, you can actually have molecules because they won't cool effectively anymore. They, they can't radiate the cool anymore. So basically, we have to plug in J at this density, which is much higher. And that increases this critical flux to kind of three of them. So that's the, that's the main point, is that these halos, gas cooled by atomic cooling, trying to get dense. If you have this very large UV radiation, you can actually keep it free of hydrogen molecules up to this density and then they're, they're set because afterwards there cannot be any more molecular cooling. Uh, I will skip to the last points. I should say that this is not so trivial calculation. This is simplified, of course, the argument. Uh, maybe I show one or two slides here. So this, this whole argument, I hope, made sense. Basically, can be confirmed in simulation. So we, did, we did the simulation with Enzo, where we basically did just what I just described. So we have simulated three halos in the high redshift universe, collapsing around redshift 10, with halo masses of 10 to the 8 solar masses. So these are larger than the mean halos, so they can cool by atomic cooling. And then these halos were simulated. I don't know if you can read this. This is the density profile. I don't know if you can still read it from the back. This is resolved by the MIS in Parsec. And these are density profiles. And then these are temperature profiles with different assumed levels of the flux. And this is just meant to show you that in this simulation, we have this centrally condensed object. The temperature likes to cool down to 2 or 300 Kelvin in the molecule formation. But if you actually see this blue curve, when the Plus was about the critical level, it just stays at 10 to 4. This is the H2 fraction. It bifurcates. And this is precisely this critical flux such that by the density of 10 to 4, you inform molecules. It's a very well defined critical flux, which is, which depending on the spectral shape, uh, there is actually quite significant. I think I want to come to discuss this. But it's about 10 to 4 or 5. Uh, I think I'll skip this. We have to do a trivial of the work. We do self-shielding of H2 because H2 has many lines. 
uh, as sampled by the halos. And so the vast majority of halos just see in the background, which is here set to be 40, 40, 30. But there is a tail, and you see that this is actually six orders of magnitude. So about one in a million halos are actually in this tail. You see this very high box. And those are the ones with the bright neighbors. And so maybe I'll simply put you know, because you would think that's a bit crazy. Uh, only one in a million halos have a bright enough neighbor to provide large enough flux to the rest of the But in fact, it turns out that that's actually just enough because uh, in, in about a cubic gigaparsec, there's about a thousand, about one billion halos in kind of itself. That's just a large probability one. And one in a million, there is still a thousand halos. And so basically, that's still enough to make the few turbulence on black holes. So it just works in terms of these numbers. So this would work. Uh, but in the center of a very rare candidate solar mass halo with a bright neighbor would make a super massive black hole. Uh, this would be spoiled by the presence of metals and other things. But I think I will just stop here. <coughs> I'm just going to talk about observations, but people can ask me. Uh, they want. So I just put up my conclusions. I basically said this theory of solar mass black holes forming by H6 quite challenging. You either have to have the very optimistic assumption that stellar masses grow all the time and never interrupt the growth. Or you have to have direct collapse in a halo with a very unusual bright neighbor halo nearby, but no metals. Uh, and I mentioned this extra challenge not to work with the low mass black holes. And I think Probably the best way, I mean, well, the best way, just to say one thing about future, the best way to decide on this would actually be the gravitation waves, MISA, because you would actually see that there are four or five solar mass black holes that actually have the gravitation waves when they merge. So you have an idea of the merger rates, and you could call these assignments. I guess I'll stop here. Thanks. the 
ಮಾಲ್ ಹಾಸ್ಪಿಟಲ್ಸ್ ರಬರ್ ಸ್ಕ್ರೀನ್ ರಬರ್ ಸ್ಕ್ರೀನ್ ಎಲ್ಲ ಒಳ್ಳೆ ಹಾಸ್ಪಿಟಲ್ಸ್ ಇದೆ ಯಾ ಸೋ ಐ ಶುಡ್ ರಿಮೈನ್ ಅಟ್ ನೌ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ನಾನು ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಇಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಡೇ ಅಬೌಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇನ್ ಆಫ್ ದೇ ಯಾ ಯಾ ಅಚ್ಚಿ ಟು ಆರ್ ಸಮ್ ಮೈನ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಮಾಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಫೈವ್ ಆರ್ ಫೈವ್ ಫೋರ್ ಸಮ್ ಮೈನ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಮೈನ್ ಟು ಓವರ್ ವಿಚ್ ವಿ ಶುಡ್ ಆಚ್ಚಿ ಬಿ ಟೆಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ದಿಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಮಾಸ್ ಫಂಕ್ಷನ್ ಐ ಆಚ್ಚಿ ಸೆಲ್ ಇಟ್ ವೆರಿ ಸ್ಟಿಕ್ ಸೋ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಟು ಆಲ್ ಅದರ್ ಕಸ್ಟಮರ್ಸ್ ಆನ್ ದಿ ಕಾಂಪೌಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ಸ್ ಬೈ ನ್ಯಾಚುರ